I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Kurt Langlotz, uh, who is a professor of radiology and biomedical informatics and director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence in Medicine and Imaging, the Amy Center at Stanford University. Uh, as medical informatics director for Stanford Healthcare, he's also responsible for the computer technology that supports the Stanford radiology practice. And he's also, he also serves on the board of directors of the Radiologic Society of North America. Welcome, Kurt. Thank you, Serena, and thank you, Matt. Uh, I'd just like to add my welcome to yours, to the thousands of people who've joined us online today. We're just very pleased that you're here. Uh, I have been on sabbatical for the last couple of months, and so uh, the credit for the organization of this meeting really goes to Matt and Serena and to the planning committee and Joanna Kim, who's our executive director, uh, Jacqueline Thomas, who does our administrative support, and all of the speakers and panelists that you'll hear from later today. So I am just so excited about what we have in store for everyone in attendance today. I'd like to uh, share my screen and start first with just a brief tribute to someone we lost recently. We're all heartbroken to say goodbye to a beloved leader and mentor, Sanjeev Sam Gambier. Sam was the chair of the radiology department at Stanford who died of cancer on July 18th. He's on the left in this photo, which was taken at a, at a recent Stanford Healthcare AI bootcamp graduation. He was a, a brilliant man who knew so much about so many things, laboratory science, clinical care, translational research, commercial enterprise, and of course, AI but his brilliance was really the brightest in how he related to others. He expressed warmth and care to everyone around him. It was abundantly clear he truly loved those who worked for him and with him. He had a, an incredible quick wit. Uh, just one example of his sense of humor. As this photo was taken, we were bantering about the investment that Sam had made in the Amy Center. So he pulled out his wallet and handed it to me. Uh, because of his many gifts, he was a magnet for, for great people and abundant resources. He was the only leader who said to us, don't worry about the money. If you have an idea for innovation, we will find a way to make it happen. And so he did. He was the strongest early supporter of the Amy Center concept. He helped build a community of support for our work. And the Amy Center's core values, interdisciplinary, collaborative, ethical, diverse, and inclusive, come directly from Sam. It's not an exaggeration to say that without Sam, the Amy Center would not exist. Sam was a quietly charismatic leader who could quickly bring a room full of serious scientists to either raucous laughter or quiet tears with just a few, few words, sometimes just a few minutes apart. He has helped us all get through previous tragedies and led us to celebrate great successes. So, at this point, I'd like to take a moment of silence now to remember Sam's contribution to science and to the world at large and the indelible, indelible impression that he's made on the lives of all of us. Thank you. All right, uh, at this point, I know that uh, not all of you are familiar with the Amy Center. So I'd like to take a minute to highlight some of our activities and illustrate some of the themes that you'll see in the conference to come. Uh, this slide just illustrates our interdisciplinary nature and our mission. So the mission of the Amy Center is to support outstanding interdisciplinary AI research that advances how imaging and other clinical information is used to promote health. Our foundation really is the collaboration and partnering with industry. Uh, we believe that if we're solving real problems, that leads to new methods and that kind of productive collaboration that we see between basic scientists and clinician scientists. This slide is just a picture of our now over 120 affiliated faculty at Stanford across 20 departments and three schools. We see that as the core of our, our mission. We also are focused really on high quality science 
And you can see here some of the publications. We had a recent publication in Nature on echocardiography that you'll hear about more later in the program. Uh, we had the International Medical Informatics Association best paper and Matt's work, of course, on the chest x-rays, which has been cited now over 650 times just since its publication in 2017. And we think that this, this kind of high quality science really amplifies our impact on patients and allows us to, to do more in the future by bringing in additional resources. I often uh, share as ta in talks like this uh, examples of radiology uh, projects that we have, uh, research that we have to illustrate the various themes related to machine learning and AI. This just gives you a, a sense of that. Uh, I thought I'd do something different for this talk because I think by now, uh, many of you have a significant awareness of our radiology work. If you do wanna see that, there's a QR code there in the right upper right corner to a lightning talk we have on our YouTube channel that you can, you can listen to. But instead, what I thought I would do today is highlight some of the recent research that we uh, have funded through our C grant program, often outside of radiology. The C grant program is one of our Amy Center pillars, uh, our tactics to really foster the research that we do. So uh, catalyzing extramural funding, that's what our C grant uh, program is intended to do, to help people get started uh, with early research, groundbreaking research. We also build data science research infrastructure, including uh, support for evaluation, dissemination, and commercialization of our uh, algorithms. We do facilitate that interdisciplinary collaboration in a variety of ways and uh, educating and engaging the community, including in, in meetings like this. So uh, here are our first wave of seed grants, which were funded in 2019. You can see that uh, it's a highly diverse set of projects. Yes, we do have a couple of radiology projects in there, including an interventional radiology project. We have cardiac uh, imaging projects, dermatology, uh, radiomics. We have one project that takes advantage of the images available at our VA hospital. Some of these are foundational, some are translational, some are applied, and all of them by tremendously talented scientists. So I'd like to highlight now just a few of these seven projects. The first is uh, the work of uh, David Uyang with you and Ashley, James O, and, and Robert, uh, Bob Harrington at our, uh, at our place in our Department of Medicine. Um, David Uyang was a, is a, was a cardiology fellow, now faculty at uh, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. This project used semantic segmentations and dilated convolutions, as well as a spatiotemporal model ensemble together uh, to predict ejection fraction from echocardiographic images. Uh, this, this model was trained at Stanford and then externally validated using data from Cedars-Sinai and had a very low uh, prediction error, 6%, R squared of 0.77 and an AUC of 0.96. Those statistics are in the range of the inner observer variability we see with humans. So you're seeing near, near human level performance with this kind of uh, algorithm. Exciting work published in Nature. And also you see here that echocardiograms are able to predict a number of other human characteristics, gender, weight, age, and height, something that most humans don't do, but interesting. The next project I'll highlight is the work of Eleni Linos from Dermatology and Olivia Gavart from our Data Sciences Department. Uh, this relates to uh, basal cell carcinoma. So uh, most people don't realize that Basal cell carcinoma accounts for two times more cancer diagnosis each year than all other cancers combined. Now it's a relatively indolent cancer, but still all the lesions are generally treated with a procedure and these procedures can have complications as high as 25%. So, but there's good evidence that older patients can do well with just active surveillance of these lesions. So the purpose of this project is to develop a mobile phone based tool that could uh, conduct surveillance of these lesions using photographs and could enable particularly elderly patients to remain ho home and avoid the kinds of procedures that are typically needed. This is still early work, it's unpublished, but uh, interesting work to, to track low risk basal cell carcinoma. This next project uh, comes out of Greg Zaharchuk's lab uh, by Jan and Yu, postdoc there. And on the left here, you see a cerebral angiogram and uh, the treatment for uh, uh, when patients are undergoing uh, an acute ischemic stroke 
often have a, a clot, the treatment is thrombectomy. And so you have individuals who are scrubbed into the angio suite looking at these images and on very short order trying to determine whether patients have uh, a, a thrombus or not. And that's a, a time in which this kind of decision support would be very helpful. And so they have built a, a, an ensemble model uh, that takes, this is from over 180,000 samples from a thousand, over a thousand uh, digital subtraction angiographic scans. They've ensembled together a two and a half dimension approach processing uh, consecutive five frames as well as a maximum intensity projection image analysis and then analysis of some metadata, as I said, ensembled together. And you can see the areas under the ROC curve in the lower right there, just for the binary decision of occlusion, no occlusion is 0.88, and then the numbers for large, medium, and small occlusions. So uh, important early work. And then uh, finally, the last project I'll highlight uh, is this work related to left ventricular assist device. So one of the main complications of LVAD implementation is right ventricular failure. It's the single largest contributor to short-term mortality. Post-operative incidence is about 30%. And unfortunately, all of the current prediction scores, and you can see the ROC curves there on the right, uh, are really very close to chance. AUC is about 0.5 with all the current clinical risk scores. So their approach is to focus on the preoperative echocardiogram to detect subclinical primary right ventricular dysfunction. And they're using a custom 3D convolutional neural network for pre -op, the pre-op apical four chamber transthoracic echo. And I think this illustrates, you're seeing a theme here with this project and many others, uh, that, the, that the models that we need for the kind of complex data that we're typically seeing now for the more interesting clinical problems these are not off the shelf models that were used for ImageNet. These are models that are tailored for the specific clinical problem that they're trying to solve. And so what they've built here, uh, the model that they have built has an area under the uh, ROC curve of 0.85 that's validated on an external institution, which is a huge jump from the, the difficulty from the, with the previous algorithms. Again, as yet unpublished, but uh, work in progress looks very promising. I also wanna highlight one of our other pillars, which is our community engagement. We have an, an industry affiliates program, uh, which emphasizes two-way communication for the exchange of knowledge, uh, education, access to our education programs. Uh, we explore collaborations on research projects with our partners and just the general excitement of uh, the AI and medical imaging work that's going on at Stanford. And then we have several contract relationships with industry as well, joint development projects, and these are often an important avenue for commercialization of research at scale for societal impact. And as many of you know from our website, uh, we, are, we have released now eight uh, AI-ready labeled publicly available data sets with more in the pipeline. I think that's more than the rest of the world combined. Um, perhaps the world is catching up, but uh, you'll be hearing soon about the pulmonary embolism challenge that's being held by the Radiological Society of North America in conjunction with their annual meeting in November. Stanford will make publicly available PE data associated with that challenge, and there'll be data from other institutions as well. And then actually later today, you'll be hearing a major announcement uh, about a, uh, a COVID-19 imaging data repository uh, where uh, many of us are, as part of an RSNA, ACR, and AAPM project are teaming up to put together a repository and much of the work around that. So that'll make additional COVID data publicly available. And we of course love to engage with the world and educate people both at Stanford and, and around the world. Uh, we have our monthly AMI IBIS. IBIS is our uh, Integrative Biomedical Imaging Informatics Division here in the Radiology Department at Stanford. We have a joint seminar series monthly with them. We hold our weekly work in progress meetings. We have journal clubs, town halls, including this actionable change for racial bias in tech that we held recently. Uh, we have office hours, happy hours. You've probably heard about hackathon. So many ways in which we engage with the community. And if you're interested in any of those, while you look at our beautiful new space at 1701 Page Mill Road, uh, consider following us on social media, or there's the link there to uh, join our mailing list if you wanna hear more about the activities that we have 
going on. So with that, I'm, I'm extremely proud of the program we put together today. We've got fantastic speakers and panelists, new ways for you to engage with one another. And I think it'll be a, a provocative and stimulating day, uh, day today. I expect you will enjoy it. So uh, thank you. Thank you.